Thank you for listening. Um, I am going to pass you over to Simeon. Simeon has lectured for us before. He's a fantastic lecturer. I'm so excited about our lecture today because um, we've got quite a treat in store today, haven't we, Simeon? I hope so. I think it is. I hope so. <laughs> Something yeah. very new. Yes, we have. I'll let it to you. Yes, we have. We definitely do. I, I even got my English team mug here. You know, uh, of course, we've got the Eurovision here at the moment, you know. Yeah. Madonna just arrived. It's all very exciting. Moving on. So, uh, so th th well, thank you for inviting me and welcome everyone. I'm just having a look at some of the names here. Don't be too hard on me. I, I, I'm, I hope this is exciting. It's, um, it's really a, an, it's the first time I've given this uh, particular webinar. It's something I'm really, really passionate about. And um, so I'm hoping that it will be uh, the start of something. One of the, the colleges here wants me to I want to sort of run a course on trigger points and osteopathy. So this is, a, I'd be very interested in your feedback, but um, I think we should start now. Let's just start because I've only got an hour. Can we start? Beautiful. Let's do it. So I am going to choose my PowerPoint. And you're going to tell me, Hindi, is that good? We, we're all on? Okay. Well. And you can hear me good? Yeah, everything's fine. Perfect. So welcome everyone. Um, yeah, myofascial trigger points because um, because they're in the myofascia, um, and I really do believe that it is a marriage made in heaven. I've been um, I've been osteopath since I qualified in 1992 from the British School of Oste Osteopathy, as it was, um, and I really got into trigger points in my second year of college, and there was one of the profs was really heavily into trigger points, um, and pretty much. Um, as soon as I started to learn about them, spraying stretch techniques, and I, I, I sort of was fascinated. Um, and I've taken it sort of a lot further, really. I've, I've really kind of got into it now. And I think that, that actually, for me personally, trigger, osteopathy without trigger points, it just doesn't, doesn't really work for me. Um, because actually, um, and hopefully what I would like to demonstrate tonight is that osteopathy and trigger points really are talking about the same thing this sort of mechanical dysfunction biomechanical models uh, structurally from a structural perspective so why trigger points well i think that um we have as an osteopath we have a toolbox uh the hvt we have a whole range of tools and i think to understand the the language of trigger points to really see the power of it how we can use it clinically uh, just has added to me a whole other dimension. I really found kind of a complete practitioner once I, once I understood the whole sort of trigger point model. The other thing is that um, actually trigger point medicine has really exploded. It really has. Um, there are now 800, you can't believe 800 medical doctors in Israel that are all doing uh, IMS needling and trigger point work. Um, and one of the reasons they're doing it is it's really quick, it's really effective. And GPs are kind of bored. They're bored of not being able to help their patients. And they're starting to learn it. And as they learn about trigger points, they're learning about osteopathy and they're learning about, uh, and they're very, very interested. So it's a real opportunity for us to take a leadership role and, and a, a place for us to sort of synthesize a common language, if you like, um, between, you know, I'm having conversations with neurosurgeons and orthopods and neurologists, and, and it's just an, an amazing time to be uh, looking at trigger points and, and involved. And, and I think the other thing is that we are, forgive me, Pindi, but we are the kind of priests of touch. And actually, um, one of the real keys of trigger points is being able to actually palpate them. Uh, and, you know, it's very interesting. I teach, I do a, a lot of teaching with MDs, with, with uh, doctors, and they just have no palpatory skills, or very, very poor. They, they, they don't feel, they, they kind of push. So for us, it's, it's, it's an incredible opportunity. Well, certainly, I believe. Um, they're very efficient, they're very effective, and I um, wrote this book called The Concise Book of Trigger Points. So that's, I did it about 14 years ago now, maybe 15 years ago. It's now in its third edition. It really is the, the, the Harry Potter of the trigger point world. Uh, exactly. I'm not only the same. Anyway, and, uh, but actually, as I was writing the book, um, I realized that actually trigger points are three-dimensional uh, so uh, in the book itself, the diagrams are two-dimensional. So I kind of thought what would be more helpful for me is if I could somehow have a 3D model that I could zoom in and look and move and kind of explore these three points. And 
Um, and actually there wasn't anything good enough, so I have invented one. And I'm gonna kind of launch it tonight, uh, we'll explore it with you um, together and see what you think. And again, I appreciate your feedback and we'll take it from there. It's quite exciting really. So um, let's talk about trigger points themselves. So, so really uh, interesting going back into the, some of the literature, um, the, the sort of Eastern philosophical, Eastern medical practices um, have been looking at, at painful knots, painful trigger points, uh, our chi points that are going to the literature in a second for, for thousands of years. This is actually a painting from an Egyptian cave, um, reflexology maybe, um, but um, it really has only been the last sort of 150 years that the Western medicine has kind of grabbed onto to trigger points. And really over the last 50 years, the trigger points themselves have become a, a model. Um, there were all things like what, lumbalgia and um, lumbago, all of these uh, sort of vague symptoms. But, but I think Western medicine has really started to embrace uh, some of these concepts now. So in terms of the ancient world, you know, there was this book that they called The Yellow Emperor, 2700 BC. Is that people asking questions about that already? Share notes. Um, and um, we see that, that, that they were talking about trigger points there, we're talking about shiatsu there, uh, talking about archi, uh, pain, pain knots. There was a school of massage, 581 AD in China. In the West, uh, Hippocrates uh, wrote extensively about uh, rubbing and, and, and looking at the, the physical body and the Greco-Roman medicine. So we can see that, that you know, that, and, and of course it makes sense, doesn't it? Because, you know, we are, we, are, we explore the language of touch in our, in our therapeutic relationship. And of course, you know, when we, we know instinctively as osteopaths, when we're working with soft tissues, that we feel these painful knots and we hold them and they have this, this kind of magic effect of producing this, this diverse map and letting patients relax into it. So, so it's not surprising that, that they've been written about. But what's more exciting in, in sort of the, the modern world, oh dear, have I done so wrong? In the modern world is that, um, that we are able to sort of define them more and, and really explore them more as that kind of medical paradigm perspective has grown. So, so let's go straight on to, to osteopathy. So um, of course, Andrew Taylor still was very, very, very interested in the fascia. Uh, I've got a whole book, uh, which I'm happy to share the reference uh, of Taylor still uh, waxing and uh, lyrical about the fascia. He believed that the fascia is the place to look for the cause of all disease, the place to begin and the place to end with all the, uh, all the remedies are within the fascia. Of course, we know about his structure governs function, um, uh, ph philosophical uh, osteopathic uh, principle. Um, and here's a picture from, from his book. It's called The First Lesson in Osteopathy. <coughs> and I'm sure many of you know the story, but he used to suffer terribly with, uh, with, with cervicogenic headaches, with, with headaches from the cervical spine. And he devised a, a, a rope that he would rest the back of his neck on and it would push on the suboccipital muscles. And lo and behold, it, he fixed his headaches. So, Really, this is a, a trigger point release method. We call it inhibition compression. So, so his first lesson in osteopathy was actually a trigger point lesson uh, as well. Uh, I'm not saying. Um, so as I said, he, he loved the fascia uh, and he talked about the fascia being omnipresent. Uh, you know, there is a, actually this idea of a single muscle theory that there's only one muscle in the body and it's kind of interwoven with different fascial planes. And he, he would be a one muscle kind of guy, actually, because when he looked at the fascia, he, he really, really did love it. He, he talked about the, the material of man uh, and the dwelling place of the, the physical being and the soul and the house of God, everything being, as far as he was concerned, in the fascia. And of course, what, what muscles are, are the contractile element within the fascia. The fascia is the envelope and the muscle is this kind of contractile, sort of flexible element within the fascia. So, um, as I started to, to look at some of the exciting things about that, how osteopathy and, and, and trigger points work together, you know, sometimes you can put your hands on someone and you can feel that, that there are lots of trigger points in the sort of upper trapezius, the scaling, the sternomastoid muscles. And then you do an HVT technique and all of a sudden everything just gives way, right? So it, 
clearly there's a huge efficiency in being able to bring together HVT, for example, and the trigger point concept. Uh, Pindi, are you still there? I am here, sorry. Is, yeah. it, is it going okay so far? I'm just checking in. Absolutely. You know, yeah, great. The sound's got a lot better as well. Something changed with your sound, but it's amazing. Okay, so far. Okay, perfect. So, so it, it, you know, I, sometimes I'm, I'm giving workshops and I'm, I'm looking at doctors and, 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 it, and it's so easy just to do an HVT technique to disable these trigger points rather than go through the rigmarole of positional release and needling techniques as well. So clearly, what, when we're doing HVT, when we're looking at structural osteopathy, we're having an effect on something central, something that's kind of figuring into this whole trigger point model. But is it a chicken? Is it an egg? What came first? Is it the trigger points that cause the struck the, the, the motion, uh, range of motion dysfunction? Or is it the, the, the range of motion or sort of, uh, sort of spondylar, spondylar arthrotic neck, for example, or whiplash? Great example, uh, whiplash that has these uh, scalenes or longest coli trigger points. Uh, sternocleidomastoid, for example. Uh, people that can't turn their neck uh, left or right. Uh, older people that have uh, had a whiplash and that they're really restricted. When we work the sternocleidomastoid trigger points, even in one session, they're able to get full range of motion. But the question is, you know, what are these mechanisms? And some of the really interesting uh, mechanisms that we're, we're exploring now in trigger point medicine uh, are really throwing a light on perhaps the way osteopathy uh, works and some of the, the sort of deeper osteopathic sort of models. For example, for example, um, I'm sure many of you do uh, needling work and I use a technique called IMS or intramuscular stimulation, which is a uh, needling into the uh, directly into the, the muscle, the myofascia. And when we hit the, the trigger point, we get a twitch, a twitch response. Um, in fact, we twitch until the, that fatigues that response. And that twitch response, you know, I, I know I speak for a few of you that have done it, and if you haven't explored that, it's, it's just kind of mind-blowing. Um, you, you think to yourself, what really is happening? This is quite incredible. What, what is going on? And in fact, it turns out that the twitch response is actually a spinal reflex arc. So... In the same way we get, we, we look at the, the, the biceps, you know, C5, C6, we're looking at triceps, we're looking at these reflexes. The twitch response is a spinal reflex. So when we put a needle in, we change that, that whole proprioceptive pattern and we're treating the, the, uh, the trigger point via the neural reflex. Well, of course, it's not only when we put a needle in, when we're actually putting pressure on the, the muscle, we're feeding into that spinal reflex arc. So uh, in many ways, um, now the way I look at osteopathy is looking at neurological patterns, very much what I call holding patterns, uh, patterns of how the nervous system holds around injury, how it shuts things down. I'm sure some of you, or maybe some of you have seen my work with the frozen shoulder. I talk a lot about holding patterns, the way the body goes into this kind of ancient shutdown. And we see these holding patterns manifest in trigger points. Trigger points, why? Because what trigger points do is they cause the muscle to be uh, short uh, and inefficient. Um, and that can be a good thing if you're the nervous system and you want to rest something. So some of the other um, interesting things is the role of the autonomic nervous system as well. Um, there's been, for example, in the sternocleidomastoid, the uh, sternal head uh, um, associated with ptosis, uh, associated with uh, conjunctivitis, so we know there's some autonomic uh, responses that you can get from working with trigger points. I also, in my work with the frozen shoulder, I look a lot at the long head of bicep and I, we, we get a parasympathetic response to that when we're holding it, we get the stomach rumbling, which is a, uh, the vagus nerve, which is a parasympathetic response. So we can look at uh, trigger points as a way into the nervous system in general. I think that's kind of where I am in my head on it including the visceral and the viscous and including these concepts of neuroplasticity as well. One of the big things they talk about uh, in the trigger point world is uh, central sensitization and peripheral sensitization, which absolutely in old osteopathy used to be called facilitation and facilitated segments. So uh, in terms of looking at the research, um, yeah, there are there are published uh, um, evidence and articles in the IGOM and the, the American Osteopathic Association. Um, uh, people looking at trigger points. So I think um, I think 
um, as a whole, in, in terms of the, the profession, uh, I think a lot of people are re working with trigger points. I'm sure many of you are be interested, excuse me. Interested to find out at the end. So let's let's come back to the history again of, of orthodox medicine. So where did where did the West start coming up with this whole name of trigger points and the notion of trigger points? So the first doctor who looked at the knotted muscles and pain from muscles, muscular pain, or myositis or fibrositis, he used to call it, was a guy called Dr. Will Gowers. Um, Bill Gowers was a Scot and he had a very big Scottish accent and he published this paper, Lumbago, uh, it's Lessons in Analogues. Um, and it was pretty much laughed uh, at for many years in 1904. It's considered, of course, by, by modern medics to be kind of uh, rueful, wishful thinking. Um, Gowers was then um, uh, taken over uh, some of his research by this man called Jonas Kelgren. And Jonas really did some really interesting work. He was one of the first people to start mapping out trigger point maps. And, and one of the things about trigger points is that they have a specific map of pain, a very distinct map of pain. And each muscle has this, this very specific map. And of course, interestingly, it's often not in the same place as where the, the muscle is, is where the origin is. So, so here we looked at, so what, what he did was he, he actually started to inject um, Kenalog and lignocaine into these trigger points, and he found these sort of anesthetized maps. And when he would find a trigger point, he would inject uh, anesthetic, and he would get it, map them out. He literally map them out and say to people, "Can you feel this? Can you feel?" And, and he would find these maps, and they're very much the basis of, of the Travell and Simon's maps. Um, so that's really interesting, isn't it? So he, he put these anesthetics in, and that's how we got these came to these maps. Um, and he concluded that the referred pain is distant from the stimulated point and may be felt in the joints, in the teeth, and even in the scrotum. Uh, for example, the external oblique can cause pain in the scrotum, trigger points, uh, and there are four trigger points in the uh, temporalis, and the two anterior to the midline, two posterior to the midline, we'll show you shortly, and they can actually cause dental pain. So, um, so he discovered, uh, he started really looking at this, um, and he was the one that sort of discovered that pain follows this spinal segmental patterns. Um, but it doesn't correspond with sensory segmental patterns. So it's looking at the motor rather than the sensory patterns. And this already starts to get a little bit uh, kind of strange. But it wasn't really until Dr. Janet Travell uh, where things started to really get interesting uh, for the trigger point story. Uh, and Dr. Travell, and later on with David Simons, her partner, uh, uh, medical partner, uh, really uh, blew this industry. They really sort of um, made it come alive. And she, she was quite an amazing woman uh, in and of herself. She was uh, a doctor. She was a female at the time when women doctors weren't very well um, sort of respected in many ways. And she was the first a female physician to the a president, uh, to JFK. And actually, she was the first non-military uh, medical doctor. And she treated JFK for many years before he became uh, president of America with severe uh, myofascial pain. He suffered terribly with myofascial pain. And he, he honestly said in his memoirs that if it wasn't for trigger point work, he would, there's no way he would have been able to uh, do what he did in office. And there's a very famous chair uh, in his, uh, in his um, house, in JFK's house, which was designed by uh, Dr. Janet Travell with all knots and knobs on it, where he would sit and <laughs> press his own little trigger points, like you know, those back knobbler things. Um, and she, she really was the, the person that, that, that took trigger points and pioneered it into a new way. And really a lot of the stuff that we do today is still very much part of her, her original sort of de definitions and principles. Um, so what are trigger points? Let's define them so they can, they're basically exquisitely painful spots within taut bands of muscle. So you have to have a taut band to have a trigger point. In fact, sometimes you don't even need a trigger point, the taut band is enough. Um, and they vary in size from little peas to sort of large lumps. And they can be felt beneath the surface uh, embedded in these taut bands. 
And the point is they're, they're exquisitely sensitive to pressure. They're hypersensitive. In fact, so tender, hyperalgesic. And when they're pressed, the patient will wince or pull away or try and sort of move away from that, from that uh, nociceptive uh, kind of input. Uh, we call it the jump sign. Um, and um, in terms of the, the size, they can vary. And it, and it also varies very much to do with the, the type of muscle fiber. For example, uh, a unipennate muscle uh, with sort of one origin, one insertion, will tend to have a single trigger point, usually in the belly of the muscle, whereas a multipinnate uh, muscle like the deltoid could have multiple trigger points. So you have to understand the muscle morphology and, and what we're looking at. So they're painful, exquisite pain, often at a discrete point. Uh, they're felt as a nodule embedded within a band. Um, and when you press on them, and this is absolutely crucial, and hold them, you've got to hold them and not come off, just hold, hold still, they cause this uh, reproduce, reproducible map of pain. And that's really, really important. And often this map is remote from the, the actual muscle itself. So here we have some uh, still just from my software, which we're looking at today. And this is the sternocleomastoid. You can see that the trigger points on the sternomastoid here, or the sternal head, uh, actually radiate um, to the eye and to the head and they can cause a cervicogenic headache. So the patient would come in with eye pain, but actually you'd be looking to treat the sternocleidomastoid. And this is one of the reasons why it's really, I think, important to understand some of these maps because um, we, we tend to see, you know, you, you, many patients come into your clinic with headaches uh, like this. So I think it's kind of beholden upon us to, to understand at least some of these maps. The other thing is that the pain itself can't be explained by other findings like neurological findings. It doesn't follow dermatomes, and it may also have some kind of autonomic uh, dysautonomia, as they say, wherever they are. So as we said before, depending on the morphology, you can have a, a single trigger point within a unipennate muscle, or you can have multiple trigger points within, uh, like for example, the serratus anterior, uh, multiple trigger points. What is really happening is this kind of overstimulation of the motor end plate. Look, there, are, there's a, there are several different theories, and I'm happy to debate it today, but let's try and kind of stick to the, what we think we know, which is that we get this overload of the, of the uh, nociceptive input, uh, and uh, the fibers start to fatigue, and they start to fail, and you start to get sarcomere failure, and over the course of the muscle, uh, that starts to lead to trigger point formation. Um, they make the host muscle shorter, fatter, and reduced efficiency. Um, and that can actually cause pressure on blood vessels and nerves. So you can get things we call myopathic plexopathy. For example, uh, there's a pr professor called Bob Gowen, who's a head of neurology at John Hopkins, talks about the pec minor uh, syndrome, where you can get thoracic outlet type of syndrome or, or plex, brachial plexus syndrome from a tight pec minor trigger points and you can needle them or press them and lo and behold you can release this kind of uh, plex, plexus, uh, brachial plexopathy. Um, they may, can also impair range of motion so it, a latissimus dorsi trigger point the patient can't uh, lift the arm up properly it's a classic sort of this um, and reduce efficiency increases the risk of injury because if something's stiff it's not working and you're going to overload it further, you can cause injury. But I want to pause here for a second and say that, in my opinion, sometimes the body wants trigger points. If I talk about something called trigger points on demand, which is a bit like kind of video on demand, because um, this kind of came from, I used to work a lot with badminton players for the British Olympic badminton team. And I once had a guy in and he twisted his ankle. He was on court, um, actually. I was on court next to the court with him and within milliseconds he had all these trigger points right on his fibularis and the peroneus group and I thought to myself look it's not disuse atrophy it's not you know this isn't this has just happened a second ago a millisecond ago and clearly it seems to me that it's really part of the body the nervous system's response to an injury is to shut that area down and how is it going to shut that down by using trigger points, because trigger points, I think, are woven into the fabric of the myofascia as part of the body's sort of protect and defense mechanism. So 
some of the theories are that we get this uneven intramuscular pressure distribution, we get or a direct trauma, um, unaccustomed eccentric contraction, for example, hamstrings overloaded, eccentric contraction in unconditioned muscle. These are people that do their sort of gym after Christmas, you know, uh, promising themselves New Year's resolutions. Uh, maximal or sub-maximal concentric contractions. This is from a guy called Donaholt. Um, and if we look at the, the picture here, I mean, can you see my my mouse moving here? Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So look, this is this is it. Now, for, for, for several years, these were thought to be a theoretical, but I'm absolutely assured by Bob Gerwin that they've, they've now photographed these in situ. You've actually got whole uh, fibers and pairs. He's going to publish a paper. They've now photographed that this is exactly what does happen. We get this sarcomere failure, we get these knots, things get stickier and the, the sarcomere starts to stick to each other. And it's that's really the basis of the trigger points. This is also where we put the, the needle or the pressure or however we decide to dis disable that, that trigger point. What we do know is that trigger points uh, themselves are part of a kind of cycle, a kind of uh, um, a nociceptive cycle that if we don't break it, can lead to a kind of vicious cycle. And of course, this is very not difficult for us to understand as osteopaths. You know, we, we know about homeostasis and, uh, and uh, actually we have this idea of this stress motor end plate, excess release of calcium, um, we get more acetylcholine to try and sort of mop up that calcium causes acidification. We get this uh, microcirculation uh, dysfunction, lack of oxygen, more uh, waste products that aren't able to move. Increase in metabolism and energy demand, more pain, more dysfunction, more small set, uh, nociceptive fiber, uh, P fiber, pain sensitive fiber uh, stimulation, increased sarcomere stimulation, more of a torque band, and it starts again. So we've got this vicious circle, and, and the, the more that you leave a, a trigger point in situ, the, the, the worse that vicious cycle can become. But there have been, um, there's a lot of evidence. I mean, that's my next slide. There is a lot of evidence. Oh dear, it didn't come out very well, did it? Um, there's a lot of evidence around um, around trigger points. Um, there was a guy called Shah that did a uh, um, micro dialysis of uh, trigger point. And what he did was he took a, a tiny, tiny needle and he put it in the trapezius trigger points and he did an assay of the fluid. And he found that all sorts of interesting stuff like uh, increased uh, uh, substance P, uh, cytokines, you know, this uh, kind of... Uh, pro-inflammatory exudates. So, so we have got a lot of, um, a lot of uh, and of course with the advent now of, of ultrasound, muscular skeletal ultrasound, there's a lot more evidence uh, every day really coming out about trigger points themselves. So I'm gonna move on now quickly to the visceral somatic and somatic visceral and sensitization. So of course, you know, I remember being at college and learning about somatic visceral, visceral somatics, and of course it's a huge part of what we do, right? I mean, visceral manipulation, um, and, and it fits right into this trigger point model. So there's a wonderfully interesting uh, Italian uh, doctor that looks at, at um, Di Giamanni, and she, she's looking at uh, uh, a lot of these syndromes. I've got some of her work to present to you shortly. Um, but they, there's clearly, um, what she's found is that the more repeated, for example, uh, gallbladder attacks or kidney cell attacks, that you get these hypersensitive hyperalgesic patches of, of trigger points within muscles and that actually she's, they've linked sort of muscle spasm to being uh, if it's not removed to actually feeding into the whole episodes of kidney stones well of course it's no you know for us as osteopaths it's not there's no new news here right this is what we've been saying for a long time that the, the somatovisceral and the visceral somatic uh, uh, systems are interwoven um, but, but I think what's interesting is now, now it's got into that kind of medical realm and they're, they're, they're really quite open and they're not hostile, at least in my experience, uh, is this whole notion of, of sensitization. So this whole notion of, uh, of a peripheral sensitization, which is where you have this chronic situation that starts for you know, a week to two weeks, up to a month. And you're not, there's this situation where this pain is inducing pain spasm, pain cycles, sorry, air conditioning. Uh, I didn't used to have it in, in England, I'm just saying. Um, then um, there's pain spasm, pain cycles. And with the peripheral sensitization, you get this, um, 
increased gain in the nervous system, this increase what we call nociceptive gain or wind up, where within two or three segments uh, of the of the sort of uh, the insult, if you like, of the spinal insult coming, if like T2, for example, could be uh, from um, from something uh, in the sort of thoracic erector spining, you, you get uh, a kind of a lowering of the pain threshold. Why is that important? Because, of course, the body wants to sensitize itself so that it doesn't cause more damage. Now, that's obviously fine for, for a, a small period of time, but it, if it goes on for more than a month, we can get something called central sensitization, and that just involves up to five segments and also that some of the central nervous system as well. So the concepts, of course, very similar to facilitation, facilitated segments that we're used to, um, but it's perhaps taken a little bit slightly differently, um, is that the trigger points can actually start mapping in, in anywhere between two and five uh, versatile levels. So let's say, for example, a whiplash, you've got C5, 6, um, uh, supraspinatus or uh, involvement after a whiplash. Um, a shoulder injury, um, then other C3, 4, C4, 5, C5, 6, all the way down to the upper thoracic spine. Some of those uh, trigger points can start feeding in and causing part of this kind of uh, sensitization pattern. Uh, and that's where things get a little bit more difficult when you get these chronic situations where you have to start kind of undoing them. Um, so let's have a little look at some of this evidence. This is not a good slide. I don't know why, just talk amongst yourselves. So, I guess I'm going to try again. So, trigger points have been imaged. Uh, they have been shown through fMRI scans. They have been demonstrated electrophysiologically, especially the twitch response, which you can see here on this diagram here. This was a LTR, local twitch response in a rabbit gastrocnemius tender spot. Um, and when they put the needle in, they saw this uh, twitch response accurately within the trigger point, and it wasn't there when there was no uh, needle or stimulus at that spot. Um, biochemical changes, we talked about Shah before, and it's also shown that manipulation of the trigger points can uh, reduce, uh, uh, induce uh, local referred pain, and also reduce local referred pain. So, of course, this feeds into osteopathic evidence as well. So this is the lady I was talking about, Maria Giambardino, and she's very nice, actually. I was, I was at a conference recently with her, and she, she's put together a list of these are kind of primary visceral somatic pain responses. So we can look here now, so let's get, start to get a bit more kind of into it now. This is the pan for the obliques. Uh, and actually, you can see that the referred pain pattern for the obliques, the lateral obliques, is very much uh, a very localized spot here. Now, lateral obliques are, are very much connected with, in terms of her research with, uh, with gallstones, with the gallbladder problems. And according to her is that if you if we get this hyperalgesia, this, this hyper uh, um, pain uh, around this lateral oblique, and then it, repeated gallstones can start to cause uh, these, uh, and kidney stones, start to cause these obliques to start getting trigger points. And if you don't treat the trigger points, they can actually feed into this kind of whole somatovisceral or visceral somatic circle. The rectus abdominis, again, very, very important uh, muscle for uh, visceral pain. Um, even though it's at the front, most of the, the pain patterns are felt across the spine. Uh, the iliocostalis thoracis at T6 um, usually refers pain right here to the, which is just like a gastric ulcer, GERD, reflux. Um, some people, it's usually on the right side. And of course, the external oblique, this has got a huge uh, referred pain pattern very much associated with viscerosomatic symptoms. So I put in this uh, slide from her workshop that she did, looking at ischemic heart disease, which is uh, cardiac artery disease, and gallbladders. Uh, and she looked at this rectus abdominis and this uh, um, the lateral obliques and the iliocostalis. And she found that um, in terms of gallstones or sort of biliary calculoses uh, from the viscous that, that very much had this uh, pattern involved with the trigger points. And in terms of uh, uh, biliary calculosis uh, and gallbladder um, ischemic heart disease, they have this comorbid uh, where you're starting to get 
pectoralis muscle uh, trigger points. And she was very much making the point that if you don't treat the trigger points in these muscles, then you're not, you're, you're less likely. In fact, she, she put some of the stats here, which is um, something incredible, like 96% of patients that had more than two or three episodes had these uh, very, very um, measurable trigger points through these muscles. Happy to give you the references for her work. So just to take the point a little further, let's look at uh, some things like tension type headaches. And we're gonna look at some, again, this is just lifted from the software, which I'm gonna show you shortly. Um, so how does it work? Well, look, these are the pain maps that someone will come in with and these are the muscles where you might want to look for the trigger points. So the classic, um, the classic is this uh, occip occipital frontalis or epicranius. Uh, the occipital ver causing this kind of vertical vertex pain, the frontal causing this pain across the eye. Longus coli, and what's really a nice with the software is that um, longus coli pain map was only just been properly discovered uh, about sort of a year ago it was published and I'm able to sort of include that in my uh, software because I can put it straight away so it's actually one of the first times you'll see it in 3D like this. But the upper trapezius is hugely important for headaches. Oh, longus coli why? Because we think of it as the psoas of the neck. People that have had a whiplash um, that tend to, you know, or, or survive cervicogenic pain uh, or, or disc, you know how when on an MRI you see this flattened loss of cervical curve, that's the longus coli that's starting to pull that muscle, the, the, the neck forward. And we can get these very distinct trig points uh, through the longus coli. Upper trapezius, they, they reckon, contains almost all the maps for headaches. So you can see that, um, that various headaches uh, can actually be caused by specific discrete trigger points. Uh, rectus capitis here, which is part of the uh, suboccipitals, splenius capitis, which is the uh, cervical muscle, uh, and the sternocleidomastoid. So I hope I've got to show you is that uh, sometimes to, to know where these maps are, to be able to sort of immediately think, okay, I know that's that, you know, that, that must be a sort of uh, levator scapulae, that must be sternomastoid, is really, really helpful, I think, in the therapeutic uh, situation. So I think without further ado, if it's okay, what we're gonna do is just look at the software now. Oh, I'm very nervous. Hello, welcome to Trigger Points 3D. Well this done. Is you in here. Yeah. Well, this is like the debut preview before it. Oh dear, I'm so nervous. Okay, so what have we got here? So, so let's take, um, so I think what's really helpful, as I said, is, is to be able to look at this in three dimensions. Um, so what I've tried to do here is also in the software, let's just do that, is to give you like um, the, the origins, insertions, and also to talk a little bit about the, each muscle in terms of the, the trigger point comments uh, united by this aponeurosis, the gallia and aponeurotica. Um, so I thought what we'd do is we'll take, some, we'll take a few muscles just to look at them together so that we can, you can get a kind of understanding of what we're looking at. Uh, what I've also done, uh, which I think is quite helpful, is I've got some animations in here. <laughs> and the reason I've done that is because some of the muscles, for example, again, okay, I'm going to have to move you your here. Sorry, Amy. For example, uh, if we're going to look at serratus anterior, you know, it sort of wraps around the body. So you'll, you know, if you've got the arms by the side, they, these animations are quite helpful. It's also, I find it quite helpful for uh, sort of looking at uh, sh showing patients what we're doing. So I think that they're a little bit of fun as well. Um, so let's have a look at, for example, the scalenes. Now the scalene eye muscles um, are, the scaling map is interesting because it very much looks like a C56 radiculopathy. I mean, look, if you look at where that, the pain map is, you can see it's in almost exactly the dermatome of C56. Um, and, um, but it tends to be associated with sort of um, striated pain all the way down the arm. Now in terms of these pain maps, where you'll see the dense red is where most people feel the pain. Where you'll see the more superficial uh, or the lightest um, is, is really where, where less people feel it. So, um, and again, what I've tried to do is, I try to sort of obviously put very, 
a detailed anatomy in. Um, but I didn't want it to be kind of unfriendly. Like, not like I think some of these 3D anatomy things are unfriendly, but I just say it's just nice. I, I usually show this to the patient and I say, look, you know, I think this is what's happening, that you've got a problem here. But actually, even though you're coming with pain here, you've got a problem here. Um, I also have got, uh, just to let you know, there's self-help for the patient that you can actually email them as well, things to do. Um, another feature, just uh, that's it there, is we can look and do a 3D search. For example, if someone comes in with, um, with neck pain and we're not sure what the trigger point is, because you know, you, you, all of us sort of sometimes struggle, and you can have a look at 3D search and then you can just click on. And then it gives you these options. Is your pain a little bit like that? Is there pain like that? Is it here? You can click on that and it takes you to the, to the muscle. So that it's, it's really helpful for a 3D search if, if you're not sure which uh, trigger point are. If you are sure or you, you, you remember it, then of course you can come down here and just search it or you can search it in here. So let's have a look, for example, at pec major. So the reason I want pec major is that we said before with the cardiac artery disease uh, actually does mimic heart attack. So um, we can have, uh, and we see plenty of, of clinically cases where uh, patients come in with, uh, and they've been checked out for heart pain, heart attacks. And actually, it turns out that it's trigger points. And again, look, these are the main sort of trigger point zones. There's the upper fibers, the sort of medial and the lateral fibers uh, of the pec. So that's quite a cool one there. Hello, I call him Boris. Um, let's see. So um, we can, another one I want to show you is quadratus lumborum. So we can search quadratus lumborum here. And the QL, why is the QL? Well, the QL is, is uh, a really interesting muscle. Uh, first of all, it's not where most people think it is. Uh, many people think it's, it's kind of spinal muscle, but it isn't. It attaches the 12th rib to the posterior, sort of middle third of the, of the iliac crest. Um, and why is it interesting? Well, there are four trigger points, two superficial, two deep, is that the actual referred pain map is so different from that uh, QL. And of course, the QL is a deep muscle. Um, and you can see that the, the referred pain map is, is really very much like, you know, if someone comes in with the scientists of the hip or some kind of trochanteric thing, disease or buttock pain, uh, even all the way down to the anterior thigh uh, that you might think is quads actually can be coming from QL. So I hope you're kind of starting to see why I think some of these are kind of important. Piriformis. Um, the piriformis classic muscle, of course, you know, everyone knows about piriformis syndrome. There are, uh, so in terms of the piriformis, um, the, uh, the trigger point maps uh, tend to, to cause pain very, very specifically uh, down the back of the leg and in the, the muscles. Uh, uh, and of course, we know that a certain percentage, 17% uh, of the population of sciatic nerve pierces through the flesh of the piriformis itself, and you can get these, one of these uh, plexopathy, or sort of neuropathy, or neuropathic uh, pain from uh, compression of the piriformis. Of course, there are people out there that are gonna say, no, you can't, um, I'm happy to debate that. Um, so another couple of things to show you, just what I've got you here, are the abectus abdominis. And we, we talked before about some of these visceral seratic, uh, visceral somatic or somatic visceral pains. So here's a rectus, here's a rectus sheet. Here's some of the trigger points. And have a look at these pain maps for the rectus. You can see you can all the way around here, all the way around the spine. So why is that important? Because sometimes people coming in with spinal pain, it may actually be from a rectus abdominis trigger point syndrome. Um, another really cool one is gluteus minimus. Uh, uh, and the minimus, why? Well, look at this, man. I mean, this is cool. So the minimus has got two uh, pain maps. And again, I've, I've tried to put each of these, these maps on the software. Minimus, small muscle, lies beneath the medius. Maximus is around the back here. Uh, lateral hip abductor. But look at that pain map. Look, I mean, that looks like a, an L5 dermatome, right? You, you might think someone's got an L5 disc, discopathic, discopathy. Uh, but actually, um, it's coming from specifically from trigger points in the glute minimus. And the posterior map is really extensive. I mean, look, I mean, how many of you see that pain map come in, sitting pain, 
pain in the buttock, pain in the back, sort of lateral thigh, a lateral calf. And actually, how many of us think it could be coming from this glute minimus muscle? Two more to show you, and then I'm going uh, to wrap it up a bit. Um, one is the soleus. Now, soleus is, a, again, a deep, deep to the gastrocnemius. Um, but let's have a look at some of the pain map for soleus. And look, heel pain, uh, absolute classic. So people that come in with heel pain, and you might think it's a heel spur, actually, um, well worth looking at the, the soleus itself. You can see that this actually is the trigger point here for heel pain, right on the medial border, just uh, by the sort of tenderness junction. Um, there's a proximal trigger point here, but there's kind of uh, distal trigger points very much for heel pain. And the last one, again, they're all kind of interesting to be honest, I think, is, um, is uh, I would say, the quadratus plenty. So QP, um, is a small muscle, and obviously you can see it in an animation. Let's have a look at QP. So look, heel pain. So actually very much a uh, heel spur. Um, and there are actually uh, many techniques we can use for, uh, including needling techniques to, to treat quadratus plantae. Uh, really, really useful muscle when it comes to heel pain. So let me just stop that there. So this is uh, this this is Trigger Points 3D software, and again, um, Pindy very kindly has let me uh, share an email with you afterwards to tell you all about it. Uh, just at last thing, there's a little quiz on here. Uh, if you think you know Trigger Points, you can sort of question, you know, what's that? Is that the? Mm, let me see. No, it isn't. Perfect. I, I should know because I wrote it. Okay, fine. So we've got a little quiz there. So I'm going to stop sharing the software now. I'm just going to finish off with my workshop. So, um, I, um, again, with the software, what I'm able to do is to start adding some other sort of modalities to it. And then the next thing I'm going to look at is something I call super trigger points. And super trigger points are trigger points that are permanently switched on under certain circumstances. For example, with people with shoulder problems, we tend to see infraspinatus. Uh, people with knee problems, we tend to see popliteus, hip problems, glute medius. I'm going to go into a whole kind of uh, lecture. Maybe we'll do a webinar on that as well one day. Oh, nearly done. Sorry, sorry. Nearly done. I'll go back again. Very close. Right. Um, in terms of manual techniques, of course, you know, we're, we're manual therapists. Two manual techniques, uh, ischemic compression technique used to be called, uh, uh, or inhibition compression used to be called ischemic compression and deep stroking massage. Very effective. Other techniques, spray and stretch. Um, uh, Dr. Janet uh, Travell said it, uh, spray and stretch is the most effective uh, treatment for disabling trigger points, and it's literally very unspecific but very effective. Uh, you spray, spray cold spray on the skin and then you stretch the muscle and it disables trigger points. Uh, a lot of the muscle energy techniques, wet and dry needling. So that is kind of the end of my little workshop. Um, the, the website is ready, but it's not live. I'm going live on the 4th of July to celebrate the JFK angle. <laughs> Uh, but we've got a lot of Facebook groups and things starting already. And that is me done. So I'm going to just do this. Well, can you, can you see me? So I'm going to just not share my screen. I'm going to share that one, I think. Is that is that good? No? You're sharing screen now. I think for the last couple of slides, you weren't sharing screen. I wasn't sure. Oh. If you... Let me try... Let me try this again. Uh, can you, is that sharing now? That's sharing now, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm going to just end on that slide. Uh, okay. So, um, let me see. I'm happy to take some questions or, I don't know, we've only got, got four minutes or something, but I, I don't mind going a bit further, but I don't know if there's uh, that's anything that's jumping yeah. out. Um, Yes, please do do bring your questions forward so you can uh, share comments in the chat box. So if you'd like to ask a question directly to Simeon, just go to the bottom of your screen. It'll say Q and A. Click on the Q and A, and you can type away in there. And we'll pick it up and read them out live, and Simeon can answer them for you. Yeah. This is a bit yeah. Um, and again, you know, while we're waiting for questions, um, I don't know if you have any. Oh, here we go. Uh, ah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good question. 
how long do I typically spend on a trigger point in a session? Well, look, sometimes I can spend up to, I know it's going to sound really crazy, but I can spend up to 15 minutes um, to uh, sit on a trigger point and wait for a change. I, I use a lot of inhibition compression. It, it depends on the technique you're using. I use a lot of inhibition compression or ischemic compression. And, but you're like, for example, I'm thinking of, for example, the tricep. Or, or I'm thinking of the long head of bicep in a, in a frozen shoulder. I'll sit there for five or ten minutes. It does depend. So the, the answer is a is like a you know it's like all osteopathic answers. It depends where it is. It depends how chronic it is. But I would usually spend um, I, I do half hour sessions and, and I'd say eighty percent of it's done with trigger points um, and HPT and trigger points together. Any other questions? Any Pindi? Anything you want to ask? Um, does working with trigger points help patients with chronic pain? Yeah, so um, absolutely. I think what, what we're finding about pain at the moment is this, this kind of notion of nociception, nociceptive inputs, that, that chronic pain may have a kind of central, central nervous system uh, input as well. For example, we know about uh, fibromyalgia, uh, is associated with post-traumatic stress, uh, stress disorder. That, in fact, I only found out this recently at a neurology conference that 70% uh, of, of Holocaust survivors have got uh, fibromyalgia. So it's very much to do with uh, something central, some central trigger. So uh, in terms of chronic pain, what we, by deactivating the trigger point, you lower the nociceptive input to the nervous system. So that's really the way to think of it, is that what we're doing is we're, we're lowering the nociceptive sort of feedback to that local spinal reflex loop whenever we're doing these techniques. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of it. Yeah, so the answer is definitely yes. There's a lot of work and research going into chronic pain, isn't there? And lots of wonderful... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, uh, um, you know, there are neurologists um, out there that absolutely love trigger points and work with them. And as I said, there are now 800 doctors in, in Israel, of which about 100 are really dedicated using trigger point uh, needling, especially for chronic pain uh, syndromes. There's a, an army doctor here that works with a lot of foot problems, uh, you know, soldiers in boots and things like that. Uh, and um, he's, you know, he absolutely only does trigger point work on them now. And he's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so in terms of chronic pain, chronic pain can be absolutely treated by trigger points. Mm. And I think you know, if anything, just as a kind of take home message, it's that we all, as osteopaths, we all use trigger points and we say, oh yeah, I use trigger points. I, but actually what I hope to show is that by really getting to grips with those maps and sitting there and looking at those maps and understanding that when a patient comes in, you're really able to give them the, the best service you can. I mean, and that's really what it's about. You know, if, 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 if I'm a practitioner and there's something better that I could be doing, I really want to know about it. And I think that's what's exciting to me about trigger points is that, that it is just great, uh, really efficiency. That ties in nicely with a comment that's come through from Rob. Rob Ballard, yeah. thank you for your comment, Rob. Very interesting. I do use trigger points a lot and use your frozen shoulder technique a lot too, but would be great to have a visual guide for both me and the patients. So I'm very interested in the software. Yeah, well, being vague when describing. Thank you very much, man. Listen, it's been a labour of love. I don't want to tell you, it's been a labour of love. That software, man. I mean, I spent countless sleepless nights on it. So yeah, I am. I'm hoping that. Uh, I'm hoping that. Oh, what have I done? Have I done something wrong here? Thank oh. you, Rob. So, um, yes, um, an email will be coming out to you all about it because um, you've got quite a great offer. On your yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm basically um, what my plan is for the software is to start to introduce other modules within it. So I'm going to start looking at, uh, like I said, I'm doing one on super trigger points. I've got Bob Gowen, who is um, probably well, he took over from Janet Travell and Dr. Simons. He worked with Dr. Simons and Travell. He's now 81, and he's putting together his whole needling uh, library inside the software. So you'll be able to click on a muscle, see how to do the needling techniques from really the, the world's best expert. Uh, so we're bringing that on board and I'm hoping to, you know, hoping to make that software like a, a resource that's really helpful. For example, if you've got a patient that comes in and you sort of think, oh, what can I do? And then you'll be able to just have it on your desktop 
I'm also going to be able to take patients' notes on there and record their history on there so that you're able to sort of use it as an aid memoir. Because I use some of these um, PPS software and you're not really able to do that. Uh, I've gone a bit over time, haven't I, Penny? Sorry. No, that's okay. If that's okay with everyone, we can, we can overrun it. Well, the software is $39 as the launch price, um, which is cheap. Uh, it's going to go up to like $69, $70, something like that. And when Bob Gowen comes on, that's going to be like a $200 kind of uh, thing but at the moment for you guys it's 39 dollars uh, and it's available if you go to trigger points 3d uh, on apple or on a windows store it's uh, it's also on android and ios but it's not quite as good as the i think as the, the mac and pc ones they're a bit more sort of full let's have a quick search um we've got a couple of questions here tim yeah. would like to ask tim bailey would like to ask do all trigger points have to refer to be identified? Okay, so we have uh, things called uh, active and latent trigger points. So a latent trigger point can be something like you've had a whiplash and there are still knots, but they're not painful. Uh, so they are trigger points, but we call them latent. They're not reactive. Now, what's interesting about those is if you have another whiplash, they can become active again. So they are clearly sort of woven into the, the soft, uh, soft tissue kind of myofascial uh, network. Um, so they, I think one of the defining features of trigger points is that they're active ones is that they are exquisitely sensitive to touch. Look, there are tender points, you know, there are Jones tender points, you know, we look at strain counter strain, Jones tender points, I'm sure you know all about those. There are lymphatic tender points, but in terms of a trigger point itself, uh, you yeah, know, usually they are, Exquisitely tender uh, pain dots in tall bands of muscle. Oh, thank you, Simon. That actually blends in lovely to Anthony's question: there, is how do you relate trigger points to Jones tender points? Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that there, there's, I mean, there's a seventy percent crossover with acupuncture points as well. And again, we're going to be doing an acupuncture version of the software, hopefully, with acupuncturists looking at uh, some of those relationships. But um, um, uh, the, the Jones tender points are different, they're discrete, they're different. Um, they tend, I think the Jones points, and again, I've done some Jones workshops, are, are much more sort of, uh, sort of um, osseous and sort of uh, ra rather than soft tissue, just soft tissue based. I mean, not, not only, but, but osseous. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the, you know, the anterior C's and posterior C's and that. Fantastic. All right. Um, I'm happy to come back another time and do some more. I, listen, I could, I love trigger points, man. I could talk about this forever, really. <laughs> exactly. Um, if you do have any more questions you'd like to ask, please do, because we can stay for a few more um, minutes as we back up. So have the send them through. And we will answer them before we finish up. Um, but Simeon, thank you so much. It's always such a great joy having you here, anyway. And um, Simeon's um, already done a webinar with Ossia Al. We um, looked at the um, NAT technique to release frozen shoulders and we've got a webinar that was last year and we've got a webinar next month with Simeon so um, become a member and you'll be what joined. are we doing next month I can't remember the third Wednesday normally <laughs> what am I talking about I, I have got it written down. I know we've got to look it up it's going to be very exciting that is for sure um, it's got out of my mind, but it was something we talked about. Maybe the super trigger points. Am I doing the super trigger it's points? Super points. It'll come to I'll me. tell you what, that's a good webinar. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put that one together. That's a good one. Super yeah. trigger points. Oh, it's we'll crazy. Do that. Um, um, yeah, because you can't post this lecture. So can sorry, that's kind of thrown me from what I was going to say. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, it's great having Simeon. So we've got Simeon next month. Um, membership is open. If you would like to join us and become a member with Osteo Owl, um, then please do just go to the website, which is osteoowl.com, and click on join now, and they'll bring you up with the two options of becoming a monthly member or an annual member, and you'll have access to um, Simeon's previous lecture, which he gave last year, and all the other lectures that have already happened since 2017 including um, the Great Progressive Perfect Discussion, Peer Discussion Workshops, Osteo Wellbeing, and a few clinic training videos as well, <laughs> um, are all there. And we've got a whole lot of more uh, lectures coming up. Um, we've got Simeon next month. 
we have um, Hendrik Bleck coming in talking about lymphatics. We've got Walter McCone coming in as well. And by coming in, I mean coming online. Um, we've got Henry Lee, and we've got um, we've just got some brilliant lecturers that are coming up. Next month also, we've got the Great Big Osteopathic Discussion, which will be Thursday the 20th of June, which is another event that's open to all osteopaths. And uh, the theme this year is going to be Principles and Philosophy of Osteopathy. So be sure to uh, look out for the uh, advertisements for that and join us for that. But um, that, that's, that's always a good event to attend. Simeon, would you like to share anything else with us before? Yeah, I just want to say, Pindi, thanks for inviting me and thanks for all the hard work that you do on behalf of everyone, you know, to, uh, to help with, with this CPD. Um, you know, I remember I was one of the early kind of pre-CPD people and I was, I was a bit sceptical about it at the beginning, but, but I think actually it's, a, it's really a good thing that we, we all talk to each other and thanks for the hard work that you do. I love doing it, Simeon. I love doing it. It's, it's really uh, made me wake up and pay attention to what's going on as well. <laughs> well I, was, I was quite happy to be along my clinic with my head down. Listen, and um, as I said, uh, you, you very kindly said that we can sort of send out an email about the software. And, and I would really dearly love you guys if you're interested in True Points to, 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 to download it and to give me some feedback on it because I want to make it better and I'm really excited about it. Um, like I said, it didn't exist before and I had to, you know, I, I just had to make it happen because um, I think it's really important. Yeah. Well, this is great though, isn't it? When OSIPAS launched something and your feedback really just helps, to, helps it to grow. I've had a little flick through um, with, and played around with the device and it is lovely. I like the way you can kind of move it around to get a good visualisation, especially for people that are quite visual. So um, it's going to be a good device. Um, sorry, a good adjunct to your clinic. But that will be coming out to you in your email so you can have a read of that and have all the links and have a little um, investigation yourself and buy it into a great price of $39. $39? Come on. Come on. You can't go out and eat for that, right? Well, not in Israel. So <laughs> um, <but> anyway, <laughs> from, the, from the Eurovision, <laughs> we would just say, uh, I hope Israel win. And um, listen, but I'm still love Great Britain. Uh, Pinky, I'm going to say goodbye. Good night. Goodbye. Good, night everyone. Good night. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for being here again. Um, it was lovely to see some of you yesterday. Um, it was lovely to see some new names again here today. I really hope you enjoyed the webinar platform. Simeon, you can click leave meeting and leave at any time.